So good evening, everyone, and welcome back to Sliver. For those of you who uh, are tuning in for the first time, we are continuing our mixtape playlist, and we are spending this evening or day, or depends on where you are, with the critic and writer, Joanne McNeil. Oops, I'm so sorry. Joanne is <laughs> joining us from the US, and she will share her interests and work on the ways technology shapes culture and society. Joanne was the inaugural winner of the Carl and Marilyn Thoma Arts Foundation's Arts Writing Award for an emerging writer. She has been a resident at IBEAM, a Logan uh, nonfiction program fellow, and an instructor at the School of Poetic Computation in New York City. Formerly, as the editor of Rizome at the New Museum, she transitioned the institutional blog into a daily publication, and she was one of the founding editors of The Message, the technology-focused opinion magazine published by Medium. She is also the author of Lurking, How a Person Became a User, which was published by NCD in 2020. Lurking, for her, is the practice of simply spending time online to connect with people, to learn, or just to see something interesting without necessarily seeking attention. The book is about the people's history of the internet, about what was, what has been lost, and maybe what the, what the internet has never been, but could evolve into. So 30 year of the World Wide Web is the title of tonight's lecture. And without further ado, I would like to hang over. Conversations that sometimes gets lost. Yes. And I'm going to do a little walk down memory lane um, of some highlights of the internet. But I, I do want everyone to know that these are have always been imperfect. And I just mm -hmm. want to introduce you to some of the missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. So to start, I mean, the topic of this presentation, 30 years of the World Wide Web, the funny thing about it is that this would have been true last year or the year before that, because mm -hmm. uh, Tim Berners-Lee uh, created the World Wide Web um, in 1989. But the kind of the process of when you develop something, uh, develop a digital technology, it's the launch date is another time or how it's publicly available or talked about. So this would be about 30 years since it, the web has become publicly available. And that gets us a, a pretty uh, great time frame to see uh, eras in terms of decades or so. And that's what I kind of uh, isolated in my book. So just like the book that I finished in 2018, uh, it, the final draft is submitted uh, to the copy editors in 2019, 2018, and 2020, it comes out. So it's like, I've been able to save 30 years of the World Wide Web for a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is my book lurking. It, it came out last year and it's now on paperback. Um, and that title, uh, the, the subtitle, How a Person Became a User, I feel like is, is another clue as to what I'm going to talk about today, which is the word user and how it is helpful. It's not by any means a poetic word. <laughs> uh, if anyone in this class is familiar with the work of Olia Lialina, the artist, she's written a lot about um, the role of the user and in, in my book I quote her in response to a piece by Don Norman, the, the designer, um, who says he hates the word user and she responds, well, um, just me paraphrasing, she responds, yeah, but but uh, people on the internet are, aren't just people because there are different types of people who are engaging with technology. There are, you know, the founders, the developers, there are people on the side of the product development and who have some stake in its ownership. And with this book, I wanted to emphasize that difference that if you are a user, um, those people who are on staff or uh, responsible for the technology are benefiting from your labor and creativity and involvement in relationships. And um, it's true with 
pretty much every major um, digital platform that has uh, any kind of user identity, they are collecting data on you and they are kind of using that to uh, improve upon their services. Um, and that trade off, whether it's worth it to continue participating, whether you have a choice or not, whether um, whether you actually can uh, speak up and, and get various platforms like Yahoo or uh, not yet, uh, YouTube or um, uh, Twitter to change their policies so that they're less harmful to you. That's what when my book really um, zeroes in on. Um, so to just kind of go back to those early days of like 90s internet. Um, and I, it's, it's funny to me that around the time this book came out, like Y2K is now a fashion trend. And I, I, I find that so interesting that like vintage stores that have Y2K sections. And I, I love it because I love those clothes when I was in high school. <laughs> um, so you have this excitement. I'm sure most people here are familiar with that really intense sounds of a moda makes. And mm -hmm. I, I can just say that, you know, as someone who experienced it, like what that did to me, like physically, like I just felt like it's, cause it's not just a loud sound. It's also like, it had reverberation. So you're just like sitting at your computer and it's just, it's shaking almost. And you, you're, you've got this kind of like waiting period to get on the internet. So you can almost think of that as like a train ride to work, you know, like when you're really excited to be somewhere and you've got to get on the subway and you hear all the like vibrations of the subway. That's what it felt like when you were logging into the internet back then, that sense of like anticipation first. Um, and then you're also, uh, you're, you're also stationary. So um, I, you're, you're stationary, you are, in a spot in your home that your computer is located, you don't have a phone to take with you. You don't have a, a laptop that you can take to your cafe. I mean, you might have, you, you might have a laptop, but the idea of like, uh, there were there were internet cafes back then, but they mm -hmm. were like, they would have computers set up that that's actually like, that's a little bit of a tangent, but I would like, internet cafes in the 90s are one of the least explored and, and also kind of fascinating moments of just like having a social experience of having the internet together in like physical space. Um, so one of the early online communities that I talk about in my book is called Echo. And I feel like this class in this community especially would find it interesting because it was very arts driven, it was very creative, it was based in New York City, um, called the East Coast Hangout, established in 1990, which would be about the same time as the web, but just so it's a little fine distinction, but it was not a website. It was um, it was kind of like a BBS, if you're familiar with kind of like how BBSs work, it was sort of like a BBS, it's a conferencing system. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, this was a, a true community that met on the internet. You could join, you had, uh, most people who joined would be based in New York because otherwise you're, you're paying uh, fees for the telephone service, like long distance fees. Um, and also like the benefits of being in New York meant that when they had their weekly meetups at a bar, you could always just show up and say hi. Um, and it was very, uh, culturally oriented. So because they're in New York, a lot of them are, are want to be writers and, 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 uh, artists, uh, that, that shaped a lot of the discussion and, and that, uh, the founder, Stacey Horn has a book called Cyberville, which is one of my absolute favorite books on the internet. It's a memoir of her time, um, leading this unique company and a lot of the struggles she faced in terms of moderating contents, um, how to uh, remove a user who's acting up um, and still make it a friendly place and still, you know, all, all of these kind of tensions that we think of as like modern problems, you'll see them 
in in her experiences back in the 90s and there that's that's Stacey Horn as um as a, as she was featured in Wired magazine and that um that to this day the echo community is still in touch they still use their old conferencing system which i find fascinating mm -hmm. and the way she explained it to me is like we are like um people in a small town who never left so they even as the internet 30 years have passed people are using twitter they're using instagram or you know on, on their phones people are still using the same conferencing network to stay in touch um because it is their watering hole it is their like their their home on the internet now they also use a facebook group so it's not like they they're still kind of branching out a little bit but what i what's also interesting is that because the community has been around for so long, they've, they've grown together. They've had these incredible um, experiences. And when I, I talked to someone, I, when, I, when I talked to her, she said that, you know, two people on Echo got together and got married and now that kid is in his twenties. It's just like these life events that they have, they have gone through together as an online community are, 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 are are fascinating because I would hope that people today um, who have group chats or discord uh, group communities or, or various little communities that they they organize themselves I would hope that that some people there are thinking about the longevity and thinking about like how do we stay together like that because I there are so many benefits of, of that that um, that opportunity to stay in touch like that and, and, and have all these shared memories. Um, and their archive, um, their archive of posts is now in a museum. It's, it's being archived for a museum in New York City. Uh, and it documents, um, because they're experiencing the world together and having like the kind of chit chat you would as with any of your friends, the moment 9-11 happens is documented in their archives. The OJ Simpson, uh, Way Bronco Chase. It's they're talking about it there, and their reactions are, are photo, are you know, there's a there's a, a text document that you can go back to and see that that sense of of shock and and fear and and tragedy as expressed by a community, and it's it, it, there's nothing like it. It's it's incredibly powerful to read these archives. Um, you know, one of the communities like that I talk about in the book as well from that era is AOL. And an important thing to know about AOL is that this is a corporation. <laughs> and I, I just, I, it, it's been a, a joke for many, many years that AOL was, it, it, it was so dorky and, it, and like the users were really unsophisticated. But in my book, I, I, try to position my own experiences with AOL and contrast that to someone signing up for the internet now who has to deal with things like Facebook or, or, or Instagram and, and YouTube, these like really less than ideal spaces, but you can still carve your own experience in these incredibly imperfect corporate tools. Like AOL um, was designed, the idea was kind of like, like magazines and cable television in the 90s. And I'm, I'm almost unsure how, how much um, these references I, I make sense to a younger audience. So I, I wanna like be very clear though, like around the 90s, you were kind of targeted in terms of there would be, uh, well, you know, like if, if you know a cable television show that's all about cooking. So like cable TV would have a cooking channel and then they could, the reason that they segmented was because then you could have ads on these, mm -hmm. on these cable networks that would be specifically for the audience. So AOL, as it happens, was kind of doing something interesting where they were segmenting communities. So they had like a comedy, uh, a comedy forum. They had forums for for black users or or other people of color. And like it seemed like there were strong, there were benefits of of kind of orienting people toward different 
uh, areas of AOL, but ultimately it was because they just wanted to like figure out how to target them and, and sell ads to them as magazines and, and cable channels did. Um, and this was my first experience of, of the internet. It was AOL. I was a teenager. I, um, I didn't even really understand why people use the internet at all. It just, it, it, it didn't really snap together until I, I, I had it for myself. And I went to a lot of um, groups for, for teenagers. I was hanging out in a lot of spaces for like uh, music and, and message boards, which, you know, if you've seen Reddit, like Reddit basically is, is similar to the message boards that I used back in the day. And in my book, I, I talk about, you know, some of the spaces that I, I remember getting lost in are very hard for me to uh, bring to mind without the screenshots. And I was grateful that someone on, mm -hmm. um, someone recently uh, recovered all of these screenshots of, um, of uh, an area on AOL that I had explored um, back in the day. This was for a comic known as Tank Girl. Um, and you can kind of see that like that really bright graphic, the style. I mean, part of that is influenced by the, the comic book, but also that was that was a lot of the aesthetic of the 90s. And it was a real visual experience to engage with the internet in those years. And um, the playfulness, you'll see this in a lot of the design of CD-ROM games and um, applications that that aesthetic is so strong but meanwhile like the the font is super basic I mean it's just like there that contrast between the actual images and and then um the the experience of course is you for me I am meeting utter strangers who are completely disembodied and and only representing themselves in text um and that extremely fuzzy area of reading a book and communicating with someone and that 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 was a incredibly powerful um and another kind of when we're moving along i i recently wrote a piece about yahoo answers and i i didn't talk about yahoo so much in my book <laughs> but uh i have been thinking about it a lot lately because it it is one of those big companies that is suddenly like AOL kind of just it's it's uh its relevance has just faded over time because it, it didn't it's no longer one of the big tech companies but AOL it, I, I wanted to share um a screenshot of, of the homepage from you know the 90s how it looked like now this was before Google so if you're logging into the internet 1998 or so where do you even go? Like, what do you want to do there? <laughs> uh, it's that, that experience is unique to the time. It's like, there are maybe uh, 40,000 websites in total. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are just home pages that some college student has put together as like, just like playing, at, playing around with HTML. Uh, some of them are quite involved in web zines. And so that experience that I had on AOL, you, you log in and you see this directory and you click on architecture or you click on nature or you click on sports. These directories are guiding you where to go. It's kind of like getting a trail map, like having a, a, a way to uh, navigate um, and also the websites being uh, organized for you um, that if you clicked on any of those buttons, you'd get a long list of links. And what Google did that was different is it, it was a, I mean, there were search engines. Um, you could always search the web, but the search was not super great. You would kind of, maybe if you searched for Museum of Modern Art, um, the, there was no real way to like prioritize information to show first or not. So sometimes you would get like uh, 
you'd be directed to a t-shirt company that so sells t-shirts for the Museum of Modern Art, or it would just be like the, rele the relevance of search strings were not there. But when Google came around, Google was ranking mm -hmm. links based on um, whether other people linked to them. So if you had a, if you were a university student with a homepage and you, um, linked to the Museum of Modern Art using the word in the link, Museum of Modern Art, Google would uh, calculate that those words, Museum, Modern, Art, all together and separately meant that this must be a, a reliable link. So that's where like you have, that's when this experience of the uh, portal toward the internet, the way of kind of like looking around and, and uh, exploring um, kind of a guide and search led to search us and we experience it now as like um, very powerful relevant uh, results, but also now kind of the baggage of targeted ads and all of the baggage of Silicon Valley. <laughs> um, but I, I, I am kind of, it, it is funny and I, I have, the piece is up in the Guardian now, and I, I give a little bit of a history of the co company of Yahoo, and I found myself really, really missing things like this. I'm, I miss, I mean, Wikipedia, I guess, has some elements of that area to like explore and click around and, and be directed to find information. But I, I, I that moment of the internet is, is, is kind of moved on. Um, mm -hmm. Now, um, just want to make sure uh, okay, yeah, and so now, oops, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about like the next big era of the internet, which would be the social media age, and this, this was just an iconic uh, monitor. Do you remember? Do you remember seeing these? I mean, I they they, they were so they were just so um, iconic, and and also I feel like artists hung on to them for ages. So it would be like 2011 and people were still displaying their digital art and the lampshades because they're they're interesting looking. But that was definitely like, if you're if you're around to experience the internet around 2003, you, you remember those iMac. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and meanwhile, you have the dawn of social media, which was kind of just called social networks at the Time. People didn't really know what it was, but the thing that was unique about it is for the first time, really, people are using their, their names and their faces. Now, their names are truncated. It, I would go as Joanne M. You know, you're not going to get my full name on Friendster. My image is a very, uh, very flattering, very pixelated <laughs> single image that might give you an idea of what I look like, but it's, you might not be able to recognize me on the street based on my profile image in Friendster. But there was just a sense of like moving from these, these fanciful, almost imaginary friends that you would have in the 90s that you're, you're having deep confessional conversations with and message words and chat, chat rooms. And then you're kind of merging that into your identity in the real world and finding a little, a little bit of privacy, but also, um, also using that to meet people, which Friendster was about. It was, um, it was uh, mostly a dating site, but also people did make friends there. You, I, when I signed up, there had been a, a bet there were two local DJs who had found out about Friendster and they bet that one would make more friends on it than the other. So that what ended up happening is because they both had like deep ties in, in independent music communities, they had, they had uh, got so many people to join Friendster that all of a sudden those people were adding their friends and those people were adding their friends. There were websites like this before, but they didn't have that same um, adoption. They didn't have they didn't have the adoption in Silicon Valley, which the founder had kind of initiated, but they didn't have things like what I experienced in, in Washington DC at the time, which was like 
these two teachers were like, we got to get people on here. This is a, it was a joke to them, but it ended up becoming a habit. Um, uh, the age of blogs, this, this I, I was in Washington DC and um, because there were so few blogs at the time, this would have been about 2003, everyone could just add the name of their blog on this website that was a, a DC blogger directory. Now DuPont Circle would probably be one of the most popular neighborhoods in the city. But right there, it's just like about a dozen names of blogs. This, and so when people talk about blogs now, there's like a long, uh, long history in terms of long and internet years, 10 year history of how blogs kind of evolved and moved around. But like that, those early years of blogs were incredibly social in the same way that Friendster was. You had blog meetups, you had blogger directories, you know, you drop someone an email because you're like, oh, you're in DuPont Circle too. I have a blog here's the URL, nice to meet you. This like, there was something very innocent about um, being able to meet people this way. And also uh, there had, I don't think anyone really saw this as more than just a, a joke for a year or two, not like something that is going to develop and get more involved. And um, the, the sense of scale was not, uh, an issue because when you're on Friendster, your your parents aren't on Friendster. When you're on Friendster, your boss isn't on Friendster. When you're on your blogs, you're, you know, people in 2003, it's a little bit hard to express like, but I think a lot of us here have experiences of privacy that we expected, even though we didn't practice, like we, we might not have had this like, airtight system for being private, but we just kind of expected no one would see something. That was how people were really orienting toward this early stage of social media. It was like, if I have a blog, my boss isn't gonna see it because why would my boss Google me? Like, why would my boss care that you could kind of, it, you could reasonably expect that people just wouldn't care. Um, and the, it is interesting to read blogs from about 2003 or so because of just the confessional spirit of the internet is still coming through but they're using their real names um and then in my space just about a year after friendster um a very interesting very very interesting company i wouldn't say um i, I wouldn't say if it had been successful that it would be any better than Facebook or like, I don't think it's possible for a big tech company to just at that scale to be great. But for what it was at its time, it was, it was fascinating because uh, Friendster got really, uh, got really professionalized early. And I, I still don't, I, I still don't know why. I think they, I think Friendster really did have ambitions like what Facebook would become, that you would have your, your coworkers as friends, that you would have deep ties all represented in the network. But it was, Friendster was technically not that uh, reliable. It would be down regularly. You would send someone a message and it would disappear. It was, it, there in the years that it was growing, the technical problems were just really frustrating to deal with. So a lot of people jumped ship to MySpace. Another reason people jumped ship is because uh, Friendster was kicking people off for, uh, for, for fakester identities, um, which would be if you signed up for a Friendster account as Marilyn Monroe, and you use Marilyn Monroe's image and you said all of your favorite things or what in the character Marilyn Monroe would say, then you added a bunch of people. Friendster would have, can't, would have kicked you off the service and uh, they were not that swift with people harassing people on Friendster. <laughs> but they had this idea of like the fidelity of your identity on, on Friendster and at that time, people are still uneasy about sharing themselves on the internet. So a, a platform like MySpace, which let you be a little bit silly, which let you capture some of that playful magic of 
of misrepresenting yourself or like creating a character around who you are. Um, that, that I feel like is a more natural transition to what we have in social media today. I feel like MySpace was just much more comfortable a transition if you had already gone through um, message boards and chat rooms. Um, it wasn't, there, there was no sense that you had to be um, a specific person. And also when we're talking about teenagers and 20 somethings who already have very um, flexible identities who are finding who they are, you know, those are the years that you're, you're finding your favorite movies, you're finding who you wanna be when you grow up. Um, to have a social network that's kind of encouraging you to like have an identity and stick to it, that, that's, a, that's a little bit intense. That's not, that's not what the internet is best at. Um, and now we have this one, <laughs> this company, um, which I have never thought warmly of. Um, Facebook, Facebook's founded in 2004. And it, what it did differently from these other social networks is it started at Harvard, which is considered the most prestigious university in the United States. Um, it's in, entirely because the admissions is so, um, it, it's, it's so difficult to get into that school. Um, so all of its first users um, are Harvard students. And you have this guy, he's a, he's a Harvard kid. <laughs> Even if he left, he's, he's always a Harvard kid. Um, and the way that they uh, reached out, even it was super exclusive. Like the first years they were um, opening up at other uh, prestigious universities. So only those university students could be part of it. And um, that, that meant that already these are people who are going to move into prestigious jobs. They're going to take jobs at the New York Times, they're going to take jobs at uh, various law firms and, and they're going to be quite influential individuals because they're, they're kind of on that path already. Um, and it has always been the case of social media that you join a social media site if there's someone you want to talk to there. If, you, if there's someone you, you, who's an influence on you, if there's someone, um, who you want to impress who's there. Like you don't stick around a social media site if the people aren't, if the people aren't what you, people that you would want to hang out with. So like the status element of, of Facebook was, was kind of a, an aggressive shift because on Friendster and MySpace, you have these kind of, a, a lot of uh, people who are uh, people of color or working class. Um, I know that the researcher Dana Boyd talks about a lot in terms of the individuals who would leave MySpace for Facebook because uh, there, there would be mostly white and Asian individuals who would, who would leave MySpace for Facebook. But, but I, I would go further into saying that Facebook itself was encouraging this kind of uh, this shift away from MySpace. And meanwhile, the media in, when they addressed MySpace 2008, 2009, uh, news stories were very quick to judge the users on MySpace in a way that they weren't on Facebook. Like they would say, um, everyone on MySpace is from a trailer park. They would just say very, very classist things. Um, so that, that, part of the story I feel like gets, er gets erased with time. And it's, it's important to remember that, you know, the, the professionalization of social media happened not, not accidentally. It happened because this was part of Mark Zuckerberg's vision for it, that it is, it is beginning with these people for a reason. It's keeping people out. Mm -hmm. um, and as you can see right here, what he thought of his users, even these 
kids from uni from prestigious schools what he thought of them i to read um this was a transcript from one of his conversations to a friend when he was setting it up i have over four thousand emails pictures addresses uh social security numbers his friend says what how did you manage that one and he responds in aol or that i don't think it was aol i think it was some other chat but um People just submitted it. I don't know why they trust me, dumb folks. <laughs> so he's, he's not unaware of what he's doing or what he wants. Um, and I, I think in recent years, we've seen Facebook work very, very hard to establish themselves as this like um, very, community oriented idea and that they were they were very um they were trying to build a better world or something and it's it's not true it has always been very exploitative and and from its from its origins it has been extremely exploitative and dismissive of the users that actually made it what it is um now uh how are we for time by the way i just i don't want to um make sure i've got everything you you're good you have uh, you can easily have 10 15 more minutes if you want okay, to. great um so just uh with this kind of uh of these 30 years that's going on to we're going on to this new era um and it's not perfectly 10 years at a time these moments overlap a lot and the kind of ambiguity ambiguity that i'm talking about but the iphone is launched in 2007. Now, when it is launched, most people cannot afford an iPhone. So when we talk about like the iPhone era, it is important to remember that the iPhone might have launched then, but the years that I saw everyone carrying an iPhone or something that looked like an iPhone, that would be about 2009, 2010. And that's about the time that the apps that we relate, that we associate with, with smartphones, um, began um, began making their way and making their influence on the world. Uh, Twitter and Foursquare, Instagram. Um, one kind of interesting uh, detail about this moment in, in tech history as well is that in 2009, 2010-ish, that's about the time that people from Silicon Valley are moving to New York City and starting and creating startups there. Now, if you remember from earlier, Echo was based in New York City. There was a movement of there. There were there there was a moment of a lot of startups in New York City. They were called Silicon Alley, um, and they were very media oriented, a lot more arts oriented. But over time, after the dot-com crash, especially, which would have been about you know, 2000, um, the, the tech was going back to its roots in Silicon Valley um, and the, the Bay Area. It, was, it, it felt much more strongly like that industry town. But by 2010, um, now that there's been an era of social media, people are becoming more um, accustomed to, to their identities and being very, um, very open about who they are. Maybe they're using their full names now because they're on Facebook. They're, the sense of who you are on the internet is not quite as abstracted from who you are off, offline. Um, and to this day, it's almost silly to talk about a difference because I think we all kind of have this innate sense of how we, we integrate it. And, um, but at the time there was still a sense of, I, I behave this way on a social network and I behave this way um, offline because remember Twitter, you know, people say things like the internet is real life and that's, and I know what they mean by that, where it's like, yes, the internet is real life and your experiences are real and they're not any less valid than any experience you have offline. But Twitter is not real life in that Twitter is de has developers, Twitter has algorithms, Twitter has ways that you follow people and, and they follow you and you're, you might be influenced by seeing how many people unfollow you if you tweet something like those kind of 
um, elements that that have real world consequences and real and and uh, conjure up real real feelings, real intense mm -hmm. feelings. They have been scripted. They have been these are mazes that you are working your way through in a way that your sense of autonomy there is very different, which again, you know, if you have a job, there are certain routines you have to do in your offline work environment, but we don't have those kind of algorithms and, and filters and following that kind of thing is new. Um, so, and then, you know, with Instagram, the very, an unusual thing about Instagram was um, the chance to see inside people's homes. And I can't stress enough how, how, how surprising it was. And think about it in terms of the 90s, you have your computer that you sit down at and you, nobody sees your face, nobody knows your real name. You are just deeply private in this physical space. Now, Later on, you're, you're signing up for social networks, you're putting your, maybe a picture you took with a digital camera, you're giving people some contour details of who you are. And now with your phone, you can document your world, you can document what you saw in the park, but you can also show people your house um, because you are showing your point of view and what is, what shows who you are then your own the space where you live. Now, until that point, you do not see people's houses. Like they invite you there for dinner if they trust you, if you're friends. So this, there, that, that changed quite a lot. And, and it, I, I, again, with that, my mixed feelings and nostalgia, I do, I do kind of miss that feeling of going to someone's house and not knowing it and getting like a real insight into who they are because you just, oh, they, they painted their walls an interesting color. And now with Zoom, now with, with um, so many um, experiences that where we're, we're inviting people into our houses just without even really thinking of it. Um, and so that's, uh, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> um, with all of these uh, communities that I've been discussing it, over the past um, over the past thirty years, what I always hope in my book is that readers will take from this ideas on how to shape their own experiences, and maybe that is something like creating a little private Slack or it's creating a Mastodon uh, instance, which is quite, quite involved. It's not an, an easy process, but it's, it's an option there. Um, and I, I don't think that my, the experiences that I had are necessarily any better than what you can have today. Mm -hmm. I, because like I said before, I was on AOL um, it, and it was more about the people I met and what the kind of engagement we had, the, the kind of opportunities to connect, the opportunities to connect as an individual in one space who was talking to people across the world. Um, and to this day, that is, that is the internet at its best. It is, um, if you were alone with some interests or fascinations or concerns. You can now Google, you can now explore Wikipedia, you can click around and find like-minded people. Um, and in this, I, I, I didn't want to focus too much about the elements of targeted ads and, and mm -hmm. surveillance, which I think are like, there is so much writing right now, and I'm grateful for it. There's so much writing elsewhere that, that focuses on the actual harms and how to possibly reform um, those harms, including, I know there's the GDPR in Europe, which is a start, definitely not perfect. <laughs> um, but in the US, we're, we're still kind of having these conversations, including antitrust and, and maybe breaking them up, which would make a, an enormous difference um, in terms of the ownership and 
the the real community opportunity but we still do have uh, we, we we still have tools and we still have this internet and i i strongly believe the the that you can have the big ideas and and work hard for and um, work hard for advocating for regulation and breaking up these companies. But also in the meantime, while we're waiting, let's see what we can, um, let's see if we can make our experience as, as best as we possibly can, because there are still so many alternatives, um, including on the open web, the World Wide Web. 